Hello there, my name is Peter Vale and welcome to Transforming Light Ministries. Well, I'm excited to bring you this final part three of our look at this amazing part of the constellation Taurus and its associated constellations. I highly recommend that you go back and have a look at part one and part two, and that's in TLM 25 and TLM 26 respectively, so that they build on each other and you get a full picture of what we're talking about tonight. But if not, I can give you a quick pre say and if we recap back in part one, we looked at the constellation Taurus and how it illustrates the aspect of Jesus's character and how he was zealous for the house of God, just like a bull that is strong and zealous when it charges with those mighty horns. And in part two, we looked at the constellation Orion, the one that is easily found in the heavens because of its distinctive, distinctive pot shape. We saw how it illustrates the fullness of Christ's character and how we, the foolish questioning ones, Come to, be, uh, come to a place of righteousness in Christ when we're led by the Holy Spirit and we see and we trust in the purpose that he has for us. So tonight I want to focus on the left foot of Orion and its message. When you zoom onto the left foot of Orion, you find the star Rigel, which means the foot that crushes. It also has a regal tone to it, just like what we saw in the constellation Ophesus and Scorpio in TLM 10. And in that episode, I mentioned how this fulfills the scripture, Genesis 3, verses 14 to 15. So the Lord God said to the serpent, because you have done this, you are cursed more than all cattle and more than any, every beast of the field. On your belly you shall go and you shall eat dust all the days of your life. And I'll put enmity between you and the woman and between your seed and her seed. And he shall bruise your head and you shall bruise his heel. On this left foot of Orion starts our next constellation, the constellation Eridanus. The name Eridanus means the river of the judge. The key stars in Eridanus provide us further insight into this heavenly meaning. And these are Cursa, which is on the Orion's left foot, which means bent down. Uh, Azar, which is near Cetus, it means to seize or grasp. And Akana is at the end of the river, which is all the way down that long river, all the way down towards the South Pole. This picture really intrigues me. I see a story of Jesus' walk whilst he was here on earth and an encouragement to us that there's a deep message here. When we see that this river is a river of judgment, immediately we go, oh no, What's, what do we think of this? How can there be judgment when there should be love? I'd like to present that love and judgment are on different sides of the same coin. You cannot have one without the other. So let us have a look. Firstly, let's clarify as to the context of this judgment. There are two stages of judgment. The first stage is now aimed at the serpent, and the second is after death for those who continue in their sins, as we read in the scriptures in John chapter 12, verse 46 to 48. I have come as a light into the world, and whoever believes in me should not abide in darkness. And if anyone hears my word and does not believe, I do not judge him, for if I did not come to judge the world, but to save the world. He who rejects me and does not receive my words, he that which judges him, the word that I have spoken, will judge him in the last day. And as I mentioned in TLN number three, Jesus is the final sacrifice in Hebrews chapter nine, verse 27 to 28. And it is appointed for men to die once, but after this, the judgment. So Christ was offered once to bear the sins of many. To those who eagerly wait for him, he will appear a second time apart from sin for salvation. So what is the message of Eridanus? There is a judgment before the final judgment, and it is on the devil, the serpent. And as we read previously in Genesis 3.15, we also have the following scripture in 1 John chapter 3, verses 7 to 9. Little children, let no one deceive you. He who practices righteousness is righteous, just as he is righteous. He who sins is of the devil, for the devil has sinned from the beginning. And for this purpose, the Son of God was manifested that he might destroy the works of the devil. Whoever has been born of God does not sin, for his seed remains in him, and he cannot sin because he has been born of God. Now, every step that Jesus trod was with his left foot, and each time he was crushing the devil's work. And ultimately, this brought him to the cross, where he saved people and judged the devil. Hallelujah! All praise to our Lord Jesus Christ. For the love of the Father drove the zealousness for Jesus to go to that cross and provide redemption from evil, from all the works of the devil. So how does Jesus destroy the works of the devil? How is this manifested? 
There are many illustrations of the good works of God in the Bible. There are many healings, deliverances from demons, restoration of sight, restoration of healing, even people being raised from the dead. But let's just have a look at one of them, for there are many. In Luke chapter 8, verse 26 to 33, and Then they sailed to the country of uh, Gadarenes, which is opposite Galilee. And when he stepped out on the land, he was met by a certain man from the city, who had demons for a long time. And he wore no clothes, nor did he live in a house, but in tombs. And when he saw Jesus, he cried out and fell down before him, and with a loud voice said, What have I to do with you, Jesus, Son of the Most High God? I beg you, do not torment me. For he had commanded the unclean spirit to come out of the man, for it had often seized him, and he was kept under guard, bound in chains and shackles. And he broke the bonds, and he was driven by the demon into the wilderness. Jesus asked him, saying, What is your name? And he said, Legion, because many demons had entered him. And he begat him that he should not command them to go out into the abyss. Now a herd of many swine was feeding there on the mountain. So he begged him, saying he, that he would permit them to enter them. And he permitted them. And then the demons went out of the man and entered the swine. And the herd ran violently down the street, steep place into the lake and drowned. It is interesting that Jesus was talking to the man, yet he wasn't. He was talking to the demons in the man. And those around this man shackled him up, but he was able to escape. Yet it took Jesus to deal with the real enemy, Legion. And Jesus brought judgment on those demons when he set the man free, rather than what man can do, which is just to constrain him. So what is this river of the judge? Well, back in part one, I mentioned about a constellation Taurus. And there is a cluster of stars in Taurus called Pleiades, which means the congregation of the judge. And these are his sheep that form a group of saints who have followed Jesus into the fullness of his righteousness, as the scripture says in John chapter 16, verse 7 through to 13. Nevertheless, I tell you the truth. It is to your advantage that I go away, for if I do not go away, the helper will not come to you, and if I depart, I will send him to you. And when he has come, he will convict the world of sin and of righteousness and of judgment. Of sin, because they do not believe in me. Of righteousness, because I go to my Father and you see me no more. Of judgment, because the ruler of this world is judged. And I still have many things to say to you, but you cannot bear them now. However, when he, the Spirit of truth, has come, he will guide you into all truth. For he will not speak of his own authority, but whatever he hears, he will speak. And he will tell you of things to come. So how does Jesus get us ready? Well, the key here is our feet. After Jesus' last supper, he arose to wash his disciples' feet, as we read in John chapter 13, verses 5 to 11. And after that, he poured water into a basin and began to wash the disciples' feet and to wipe them with the towel for which he was girded. And then he came to Simon Peter, and Peter said to him, Lord, are you washing my feet? And Jesus answered and said unto him, What I am doing you do not understand now, but you will know after this. And Peter said to him, You shall never wash my feet. And Jesus answered him, If I do not wash you, you have no part in me. And Simon Peter said to him, Lord, not my feet only, but also my hands and my head. And Jesus said to him, He who is bathed needs only to wash his feet, but is completely clean. But you are clean, but not all of you. For he knew who would betray him. Therefore he said, You are not all clean. Jesus made sure that their feet were clean. This just He did this just before he ascended into heaven, into where he commissioned his disciples with great power and authority in his name. And these are the ones who won, had received the gospel and believed to eternal life, and also received the guidance of the Holy Spirit to walk in the walk of, of righteousness. And three, to be deputized into the congregation of the judge, that is the same zeal that Jesus has, the purpose of which Jesus was to destroy the works of the devil. So where was this happening? In people's lives, of course, as the scripture says in Mark 16, verses 15 to 18. And he said to them, Go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. He who believes and is baptized will be saved, but he who does not believe will be condemned. And these signs will follow those who believe. In my name they will cast out demons, and they will speak with new tongues, and they will take up serpents, and if they drink anything deadly, it will by no means hurt them, and they will lay hands on the sick, and they will recover. And let's have a look what happens with the apostles Peter and John. In Acts chapter 3, verse 1 through to 10. Now Peter and John went up together to the temple at the hour of prayer, the ninth hour. And a certain man, lame from his mother's womb, was carried, 
whom they laid daily at the gate of the temple, which is called Beautiful, to ask alms of those who had entered the temple, and who, seeing Peter and John about to go into the temple, asked for alms. And fixing his eyes on him with John, Peter said, Look at us. And he gave them his attention, expecting to receive something from them. Then Peter said, Silver and gold I do not have, but what I do have I give you. In the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, rise up and walk. And he took him by the right hand and lifted him up, and immediately his feet and ankle bones received strength. So he, leaping up, stood and walked, and entered the temple with them, walking and leaping and praising God. And all the people saw him walking and praising God, and then they knew that it was he who sat begging alms at the beautiful gate of the temple. And they were filled with wonder and amazement at what had happened to him. So, double wow. This is an amazing revelation of who are the sons of God. Those who are endued with this power and authority as guided by the Holy Spirit into the fullness of Jesus' mission here on earth. This is awesome. So, how do you, do you operate in this realm of God? You can, but there's a number of decisions that need to be made. And I mentioned in the, these in the scripture earlier. You need to believe. You're having And having believed, you need to obey the leading of the conviction of the Holy Spirit. So how do you do this? Well, firstly, admit to yourself that you need to let go of your current life and all its desires for it's a sinner's life, away from God, and desire to be with Jesus, never wanting to go back. And two, believe that Jesus died for your sins on the cross and rose again on the third day. And three, cry out to him and receive his forgiveness and thank him for saving you, as the scripture says. Romans 10, verse 8 and 9. But what does it say? The word is near you, in your mouth and in your heart. That is the word of faith which we preach. That if you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. In the next episode, I'd like to have a look at the final constellation in Taurus. And guess what? I've got a different surprise for you. So, please join with us in this ministry of preaching the gospel by sharing this video with your friends. Just click on the share button and be there with them so that you can help share and answer their questions, but also to lead them through this knowledge that God has for them. And I welcome your likes, your comments, and any questions you may have. If you have ears to see, God bless you in Jesus' name.